Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for checking out my show, Coin Stories, where I get to hear from the leading voices in Bitcoin, financial markets and investing, political structures, philosophy, and more. Please make sure you're subscribed to the show. And if you're watching this on YouTube, like the video so more people see it and hit that notifications button so you don't miss out on any new content. This podcast does not provide financial advice. It is for educational and entertainment purposes only. So make sure to do your own research before making any investment decision and be aware of your risk tolerance. I'm able to produce this show thanks to my sponsors, and I'm very picky about who I choose to partner with. So I hope you take the time to listen to the ad reads throughout the show. All right, now to my first partner, where I buy my Bitcoin, Swan. I partnered with Swan because it is a Bitcoin-only company focused on helping people save for their future and self-custody their Bitcoin, not trade it. You can start a direct deposit to take advantage of Bitcoin as a savings technology and learn how to take it off the exchange. Swan's mission is to educate 10 million future Bitcoiners through free resources and media projects like Hard Money. Swan also offers retirement planning with an IRA tax loss harvesting, home equity conversion, and a white glove private client service. I use Swan to dollar cost average every day. That's right. I deposit a little bit every day that's equivalent to what I might spend on a meal so that I add to my future nest egg and lower my yearly cost basis. Swan Studios produces my hard money news reports, simplifying Bitcoin for the mass audience and documenting Bitcoin adoption around the world. To learn more and get $10 in free Bitcoin when you sign up, head to swanbitcoin.com slash Natalie Brunel. All right, it's time for the show. Whitney, it's so great to have you back on the show. I think I've told you this before, but you're my most requested, my most popular, most listened to guest. So you're, you really <laughs> are making an impact. I, I, I hope you, you, you feel that people are appreciating your investigative work because if you go to mainstream news, you're not going to find it. So thank you. No, thank you. I'm happy to be back. All right. I want to cover some of your recent investigations into banks. Uh, a, a lot of people, you know, they felt um, nervous that the banking system might be on the brink of another systemic potentially collapse. And yeah. I was curious, just maybe your reaction when you saw the bank runs happen in Silicon Valley Bank uh, go under. What did you think? Because maybe you were already researching this uh, this Jamie Dimon situation. Uh, yeah, to an extent. But, you know, the, the recent crisis with Silicon Valley Bank and, you know, uh, the, the signature bank stuff and all that related, um, you know, those related events, um, I sort of see as separate from the stuff I was writing about um, or looking into regarding the Jamie Dimon, JP Morgan, Epstein connections, in a sense, um, just because a lot of that seems to be much more related to, um, you know, U.S. government efforts to regulate crypto and sort of uh, go after banks that are deemed pro-crypto or, or could be sort of competitors to a future um, digital dollar CBDC or even competitors, for example, to the FedNow service that's due to launch in July. Uh, some people noted that, for example, Signature Bank Signet, for example, um, it may have been seen as a competitor in in that sense. And, you know, uh, as as time sort of uh, wore on with the, you know, the these particular bank uh, shutdowns, uh, it became pretty clear that at least in the case of Signature Bank, you know, that particular bank didn't really need to be shut down. And the argument from uh, regulators was that they had a crisis in the confidence of, of the leadership of the bank, allegedly because they were unwilling to end uh, their crypto business. So, you know, that definitely seems like a calculated move um, on the part of, you know, the the federal government, the federal authorities. And then, of course, you have the the issue of the, the bailout, how most of the deposits at Silicon Valley Bank were not insured. And then you have the federal government stepping in and saying they're going to make pretty much all investors at Silicon or all, all people with deposits at Silicon Valley Bank whole, uh, which, you know, in, in sort of a congressional hearings that that followed this incident you know you essentially have uh janet yellen being questioned from i think a congressman from oklahoma forget his name sorry uh and he essentially forces her to admit that um th that particular move uh means that you know or sends the signal that if your uh funds are not insured and, and are at a small community bank uh they won't be protected right um but or um but if they're at a big 
Baker Bank uh, that's deemed, you know, uh, essential uh, or, you know, they, they are willing to justify bailing out depositors due to systemic risk claims and all of that. You know, any of these too big to fail banks, for example, if you have your money there, your money is more likely to be protected than at smaller banks. And this is really consistent with what's happened over the last several economic crises. Uh, where you have, you know, further consolidation of banks over time. And you've had, you know, tens of thousands of banks uh, being shut down, largely a result of federal government monetary policy over the last several decades, um, consolidating, uh, you know, the financial industry in the United States in fewer and fewer hands. And obviously, you know, I would argue that JP Morgan has had a, a big hand in that. Uh, they tend to be one of the biggest winners from these big consolidation moves. And that's likely to be the case as this current banking crisis wears on. And it was certainly the case um, in 2008 when they, you know, acquired the remnants of Bear Stearns for pennies on the dollar. Um, so I, I think, you know, if we look at what's going on now through the lens, not just of the, of the crypto situation, but also, you know, this effort to create an even more ever consolidated uh, banking sector, you know, I think sort of the answer as to what's really going on here sort of lies uh, somewhere, somewhere in that ballpark. I want to go deeper into that idea of too big to fail and what that really means for for society and the public at large. You had a great quote in your article, The Rise of Jamie Dimon. You said that, you know, some of the figures involved were engaged in actions that would intentionally provoke the collapse of certain banks to further consolidate the banking sector for their benefit. The goal both then and now seems to be a move toward the logical conclusion of the too big to fail banking model, the eventual creation of a centralized cartel of mega banks that dominate not only commercial banking, but also central banking. Um, you know, a lot of us in Bitcoin talk about the creature of Jekyll Hyde, that there is this idea yeah. of a cartel um, and that in that consolidation of power, obviously ends up hurting the 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 average person who's trying to create a small business and trying to function in in their daily lives in America. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, why it's important that we have competition in in banks and why that model of too big to fail hurts the 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 plebs, the overall the public? <laughs> So I'm probably not the best person to answer these questions, but I think it's pretty clear that when you have, um, you know, ex ex centralized power, whether it's ex or extreme centralized power, whether it's in the federal government or the banking industry or really in any industry, it tends to be de more detrimental to the consumer than if it's more decentralized and there's greater competition, right? Um, because then you're more likely to have a, a superior uh, product come out, not just necessarily have, uh, you know, slim pickings. This is what, you know, you know, the, the three choices you can choose from instead of 20, you know, with less competition, you're going to have, um, you know, poor choices ultimately, uh, from the consumer end of things. And, uh, you tend to have people, uh, you know, when the power is increasingly centralized, you know, control becomes a big issue and it stops being about, um, you know, economic freedom to an extent and about how can we, um, you know, use our power to further certain policy agendas. Um, so, you know, I definitely think it's it's detrimental. And I think the too big to fail model over time um, has obviously proven to not be good really for anyone except the people at the top of the too big to fail system themselves. Um, and I don't really, um, you know, expect things to get better until there's major policy changes on that front. But as I just mentioned, it seems pretty likely um, that at least as the federal government is concerned, they plan to further that model to its logical conclusion. And you have people like Edward Dowd, for example, saying in recent interviews that by 2025, there'll probably only be six banks uh, left in the U.S. after this latest round of consolidation. And it's very hard not to see it, at least in this current iteration, as being intentional. And you could argue that maybe, you know, in 2008, it may have been intentional as well. And some of the stuff I hope to show in this series I'm doing on the J.P. Morgan uh, Epstein relationship, it really seems like, at least as it relates to the collapse of Bear Stearns, that collapse was intentional. Um, and uh, Jeffrey Epstein definitely seemed to have been very much in the center of that bank's collapse. And of course, it gets absorbed, as I mentioned earlier, uh, by J.P. Morgan. And there's really, you know, if you look at the deeper histories of some of these uh, financial crises in the past. So, for example, in my book um, and in my recent article, 
Um, I've written a lot about the savings and loans crisis of the 1980s and how that was, you know, sort of put um, allowed to happen to an extent because of certain policies of the Reagan administration. But then you have sort of a, a collaboration between intelligence linked figures and organized crime linked figures uh, to basically uh, loot uh, a lot of these savings and loans institutions. And then they're rescued by the federal government or bundled up and then sold to these uh, other bigger banks uh, that allow them to grow and grow and grow in size. Um, and and, you know, sort of uh, facilitating this uh, too big to fail model that already in the 1980s was really uh, coming into earnest. I mean, that's really, uh, I guess you could argue when it when it started. So um, this definitely seems to be an effort over time to consolidate control over the financial services and banking industry, because ultimately, as I'm sure you're audience knows, um, you know, whoever controls uh, money controls the world, essentially, right? So if you can control uh, financial services and banking, uh, and you have your people uh, dominating that industry, you know, the more dominance they wield over that industry, the more control they they exert, right? Whether it's on politicians or the public at large. For sure. I think I actually saw that interview with Ed Edward Dowd uh, talking about how there's going to be basically a handful of banks. And you know, what's so interesting is that every time there's like this crisis and government intervention created the moral hazards and some of the problems, the solution is more government intervention. And and ultimately, like you mentioned, I mean, the the the, the power just concentrates to this small group of unelected elites. Um, makes me think of a quote from one of Saifedean's books who wrote the Bitcoin standard. He said, in the marriage between government and banks, no one knows who wears the pants. And, and you really don't, right? One, <laughs> one controls the other. The, um, but so let's talk about your piece because you wrote another phenomenal article, uh, The Rise of Jamie Dimon. And man, so many of the same people, figures, companies from your books, yeah. um, One Nation Under Blackmail, which I have over there, uh, they they come back up. How how shocking. So there, there are links to Jeffrey Epstein and the people who kind of groomed and helped Jeff, Jeffrey Epstein rise. Um, but for folks that maybe haven't haven't read this article yet, kind of give us the 30,000 feet um, view. What What is this about and what are maybe the most interesting or shocking things that you uncovered? Um, so I guess I would say the shortest summary of this article and then the second installment that's going to be out in another week or two uh, is that the same people who enabled Jeffrey De Epstein uh, are the same people responsible for the rise of Jamie Dime, Dimon, particularly the reason why he's currently the CEO of JP Morgan. They're really the same, the same people, most definitely the same network. Um, so for people that don't know, uh, Jamie Dimon started off uh, basically being the apprentice of Sanford Weil or Sandy Weil, um, and the, together they built what is now Citigroup, and uh, due to, a, I guess, a, allegedly sort of an ego spat between the two men with Dimon allegedly not liking living in, in Weil's shadow uh, for decades, uh, there was a split and, and Dimon leaves, and then he's headhunted by a bank called Bank One uh, and becomes their CEO in uh, the year 2000. And then a few years later, Bank One merges with JP Morgan Chase. And uh, he's, you know, Diamond, of course, is put in charge of the combined entity and becomes one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful banker on Wall Street. So um, essentially what I, I show in the piece is, um, you know, some interesting connections that really surprised me. Uh, first of all, uh, that the company that Weil and Diamond used to build Citigroup, a uh, commercial credit corporation, um, I didn't realize that uh, that was the same company that I wrote about in my books until uh, <laughs> probably a few weeks ago, definitely after the books were out. And so that was very surprising to me because I know that both commercial credit corporation and its parent company company control data corp. Um, we're basically espionage cutouts for this network involving people like Robert Maxwell um, and uh, Samuel Pisar, who was Robert Maxwell's lawyer and confidant, one of his closest associates, apparently uh, the last person allegedly to speak to Robert Maxwell before he died, like, very close. Um, and he's also the stepfather and the person that essentially raised the current U.S. Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken. Um, yeah, having been, you know, essentially his father figure since the 1970s onwards. Wow. Um, and there's a lot of really crazy activities that both Control Data Corp and uh, CCC or uh, Commercial Credit Corporation were involved in, um, particularly involving, uh, for example, espionage of uh, the U.S. military, um, illicit tech transfers to the Soviet Union and what was apparently a deliberate effort to undermine U.S. national security involving people with ties to um, Eastern European intelligence, Israeli intelligence and, and other outfits that were apparently um 
interested in, in undermining um, U.S. Uh, military and also economic advantages um, for different reasons. And as I note in the piece, PSAR in the 1970s was pretty open about what these uh, the ambitions were um, of this particular group that was essentially controlling these these companies I'm I'm talking about, and he said uh, he told Congress essentially uh, that private Western capital enterprises of note uh, were were merging and intermingling to a significant extent with communist-run state enterprises. The goal of which was to produce a unified global economy, essentially a one-world economy, um, and that this was uh, eliminating the need for a nation-state. I mean, this is really crazy stuff to be telling Congress in the 70s. Um, it was very in your face especially when you consider how things have played out over time and where we stand today. And he calls this, uh, PSAR called this the rise of the trans-ideological corporation. Um, and really, it's uh, essentially what uh, has been <laughs> running the world, I guess you could argue, since then, uh, since these capital networks um, are, you know, are essentially transnational and have very little allegiance, if any, to any nation. You know, it's all about building a giant uh, global banking cartel or really, you know, corporate cartel, cartel, I guess you could say, but obviously bank banks are involved there as well. Um, and for and, people not if and for people not that familiar with PSAR, who was he? Uh, so he was best known, I guess, as an international lawyer, sometimes described as a human rights lawyer in a lot of the puff pieces about him, particularly uh, those written about his relationship with Anthony Blinken. Uh, but actually, Samuel Pisar was, you know, not necessarily entirely focused on human rights. For example, he was a lawyer uh, to a lot of major companies, including Occidental Petroleum, uh, which was run for a long time by Armand Hammer. And of course, Armand Hammer has a lot of ties to the same network I'm talking about here and tried to financially blackmail a bunch of congressmen and very shady guy. His father, uh, Julius Hammer, had been a spy for the Soviet Union. Um, he was also a, a you know a, an advisor to Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs later uh, said that uh, PSAR probably worked for the CIA or the KG, KGB. He didn't really know which one. Um, and of course, you know, PSAR had a lot of connections, very deep connections with Robert Maxwell. And Robert Maxwell, as I note in my book, you know, even though again mainstream media tends to describe him as just a media baron or media mogul, uh, he was very active in the world of intelligence, particularly in as it related to tech transfers um, and. The the use of uh, the manipulation of software for the purpose of espionage through the implementation of backdoors and things like that. Yeah. Um, but also like wholesale theft of American intellectual property through a, an operation he was intimately involved with that was run Amazing. out of uh, Bulgaria. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole lot of different yeah, crazy yeah. connections there. I, and this I, is the company. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. No, I was just going to say, everyone has to check out your book because a lot of these backstories, a lot of these <laughs> names are really explained. You go into such uh, detail. And I, I was surprised to see that Steve Jobs quote in, in your article it was really interesting. And it you trace it back all the way to the 50s. I mean, these corporations started and and you you said it was at the dawn of the American military industrial complex. And mm -hmm. they were there were contractors that were focused on cryptography and code breaking. And so now yeah. all of this stuff, this this technology is finally coming into fruition and getting into the public's hands in large numbers. And so they want to squash it right pretty quickly. Yeah, you know, I've written about that in in separate pieces, you know, going back a, a number of years about how there's a major effort by, you know, organizations that are quite influential that everyone, at least today, is pretty familiar with, like the World Economic Forum that are interested in completely eliminating uh, both, uh, you know, financial privacy and online privacy in general. Um, and, you know, a lot of the institutions involved in these partnerships housed within the WEF that have that as an explicit goal um, include the U.S. Department of Justice, the FBI the U.S. Secret Service, British and Israeli intelligence. Um, that particular program is actually run by a former longtime Israeli military intelligence veteran. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard to separate, um, you know, those particular policy agendas and see it just as something that's isolated to the WEF. This is something that the U.S. government is actively collaborating on and seeking to implement. And you actually have a lot of the same arguments that are put out in these WEF policy pa uh, papers actually currently being circulated by uh, top people in the Biden administration, for example, the claim that uh, the value of, of Bitcoin is the main driver of cybercrime. There's no evidence for that talking point. It actually just comes from um, this WEF 
draft policy paper uh, that essentially paints uh, crypto in general as a as a threat uh, to their ambitions, which is to have a completely surveilled internet and a completely surveilled financial system. And so, you know, obviously, I'm sure your audience is, is aware that the main goal to eliminate financial privacy is widespread implementation and adoption of central bank digital currencies. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the flip side of that, it's a completely related policy to have internet access be completely linked to a government issued ID. And we're seeing a renewed push for this now in the US. Uh, but actually, it was being uh, promoted really heavily during the Obama administration. They called it a driver's license for the internet. And you've seen the European Union and, and the UK government also push these uh, these policies as well, but it's really coming from this, um, you know, WEF group that is essentially, if you look at the WEF partnership against cybercrime, and if you look at their members, it's not that these intelligence agencies um, or the Department of Ju U.S. Department of Justice, like I mentioned earlier, it's those entities plus the biggest banks in the world, like Bank of America's on there, um, I, and so, you know, a lot of these big, uh, too big to fail financial institutions are essentially colluding together to eliminate uh, online and financial privacy. Um, and all they really need is some sort of cyber attack, right? Um, and, and they pretty much say it there that, you know, there'll be some sort of event that will galvanize public opinion around these policies and have people asking for a safer, more secure right. internet. And they have, you know, these particular uh, policies and uh, organizations they seek to create that will, you know, bring that into effect. Um, but, uh, you know, a big part of it is is targeting crypto. They obviously see that as a major, um, major threat to their uh, policy ambitions. It's time for a quick break to hear these messages from my partners. First up, Bitcoin Conference 2023, the world's largest Bitcoin conference, is returning to Miami Beach from May 18th to May 20th. Day one is industry day with a focus on business-minded panels and discussions plus top-tier networking opportunities. General admission days two and three are open to all pass holders and feature panels, keynotes, and workshops with speakers like Michael Lewis, Michael Saylor, Jack Maulers, Lynn Alden, Arthur Hayes, and more. Plus some exciting new additions like the inaugural Bitcoin Games and the Mining Village and the return of Pitch Day. I highly recommend this conference. It's what launched my career. And if you want to come, just head to b.tc slash conference and use the code HODL, H-O-D-L, for 10% off. I'll see you in Miami Beach. Next up, Fold. Fold is the best Bitcoin rewards debit card and shopping app in the world. You can earn Bitcoin on everything you purchase, from Amazon to groceries to sprucing up your wardrobe with Fold's Bitcoin cashback debit card. And you can win free Satoshis every day or even play for the chance to win a whole Bitcoin by spinning the daily wheel and the purchase rewards wheel. And now on Fold, you can buy Bitcoin directly and earn even more incentives and rewards by using the app to stack sats. It's an amazing app to get someone totally new into Bitcoin. So if you want to join the fun, head to foldapp.com slash Natalie and get 10,000 in free sats when you sign up. Oh, yeah. They like to capitalize on fear and crisis. We'll provide you the security. We'll give you a CBDC. You know, it's yeah. crazy. I don't care about people's politics. I hope people in the audience, no matter who you voted for, and they really do look into the history, though, because Joe Biden in the 90s, alongside Clinton, pushed for these back doors to be in everything, pushed for for there to, you know, not be encryption uh, available to the public so that your data is private um, and all under that guise of security. We're, we're preventing cyber criminals from taking over, but really it just creeps in and yeah. more and mm -hmm. more into your life. And suddenly they're watching everything you do, every dollar you, you know, you, you spend, and that's unfortunately the direction we're headed in. So, um, going back to your, to your article though, you basically say that Jamie Dimon was sort of hand selected as CEO to, to lead yeah. one of the biggest banks in this, you know, supposed cartel, why was he selected? What was it about Jamie Dimon? What should the audience know about Jamie? All right. So so the story here is is a bit interesting because the bank he was put in charge of that led to him being head of JP Morgan Chase, the position he holds today was him being selected to be CEO of Bank One. And this happened probably about a year and a half after he left Citigroup after his uh uh after he had a, his falling out with Sandy Weil. 
So essentially what happened is in the same period, you have um, Bank One's uh, CEO since the mid-1980s, John B. McCoy, uh, being forced out uh, essentially by a man named James Shine Crown, uh, who had become a key part of the Bank One Board of Directors after First Chicago NBD merged with Bank One in 1995. And uh, before that, Bank One, as I note in the article, was very intimately linked to Leslie Wexner and his associates. And actually, at the time of that merger, Leslie Wexner was on the board of Bank One. Uh, but after the merger, he ended up leaving. But one of his closest associates, uh, even closer actually to Wexner than Jeffrey Epstein, John W. Kessler, had been on the board before then, and he remained on the board. And he uh, has openly acknowledged that he played a key role in selecting Diamond uh, for that position. So basically, you had this power play where the crowns and sort of their associates uh, uh, pushed McCoy to resign because there was this big rift in Bank One between the people from this first Chicago merger and then the legacy Bank one board of directors or, or the legacy bank one directors. Um, and so in order to resolve this, I decided to select a new CEO. So after this process, the Wexner uh, centric group of the legacy bank one people, and then the crown centric group of the first Chicago NBD people decide on Jamie Dimon essentially. And so this is important because Leslie Wexner, as I've noted really extensively, not just in this article, but also in my book, um, has a lot of very disturbing connections, both to organized crime and intelligence that go way back to the 1980s. And actually the person that made Bank One what it was at this time, John B. McCoy's father, uh, John G. McCoy, it gets kind of confusing because <laughs> before him, the bank was run by his, his father, John H. McCoy. Uh, but basically this, uh, uh, the father of the CEO that was forced out in 1999 uh, was a mentor to Leslie Wexner and to Kessler. Um, and under his watch, uh, Bank One became involved in money laundering for Iran Contra arms sales, one of the top four banks utilized for that specific purpose. And actually, uh, three of those four top banks are now part of JP Morgan Chase. Um, and one of, and I think two of them were rolled into uh, uh, Valley National Bank, became part of uh, Bank one shortly thereafter. Um, so you essentially have, you know, the Wexner organized crime intelligence link group picking diamond and the crown family and the crown family is just as linked to organized crime and intelligence, if not more so than Wexner. I, the, the ties of this family and what they've been involved in throughout U.S. history is totally insane. And a lot of people probably don't know the history, but this particular uh, family uh, was uh, their empire was uh, really began with Henry Crown, who was born Henry Krinsky. Um, and uh, Henry Crown basically uh, with his brothers created a company called Material Services Corporation that during World War II um, became one of the top contractors to the U.S. military. And part of this was due to an alliance between sort of this corrupt nexus between uh, the organized crime in Chicago, where the Crown, or where the Crown family is from. Um, they had a lot of connections to organized crime and, and uh, the mob and the Democratic Party. And of course, uh, during World War II, it's the Roosevelt administration. Administration. So a close associate of Henry Crown's named Jake Avery um, connected, used his connections to get Material Service Corp uh, uh, to basically be the top contractor when uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was in power. Of course, uh, at that time, you know, the Democratic Party in New York, where Roosevelt was from, also very dominated by organized crime connections. Um, and then after that, uh, in the 50s, you have their... Um, um, their closeness, I guess, with the U.S. Uh, military and the dawn of the military industrial complex uh, becomes even closer. And then in 1959, Mas Material Services Corporation merges with General Dynamics, which today is still one of the biggest uh, UN's, U.S. weapons manufacturer in the country. And um, uh, the crowns have been influential there really ever since uh, the 1959 merger. And you have a lot of intersections with uh, general dynamics and organized crime and a lot of uh, scandals, bribery scandals, uh, price gouging scandals um, involving, you know, Material Services Corp and general dynamics through the years. And this uh, continues after uh, Henry Crown passes, you know, the family business to his son, Lester Crown, uh, which is James Shrine Crown's father, right? And Lester Crown is a longtime assistant 
associate himself of Leslie Wexner. Uh, they share a lot of connections, uh, including to the state of Israel. And Lester Crown is also a part of this organization uh, that was founded by Wexner in 1991 with Charles Bronfman that some people refer to as the mega group. Other people refer to as uh, the study group, which is essentially this, uh, they claim to be a group of philanthropists, but really it's um, a bunch of people with ties to uh, the same faction of the Jewish mob going way, way back. Uh, Wexner, Bronfman, uh, the crowns. And as I note in the book, there's several others as well that have ties to essentially the Jewish side of what uh, Gus Russo wrote about in his book, Super Mob. Uh, and Super Mob is basically about this group of um, Jewish and Italian uh, mobsters and businessmen who came together and basically merged uh, organized crime business interests uh, with political power and seemingly legitimate corporate interests and created this whole web of either outright illegal activity or gray area uh quasi illegal activity. And then it, this essentially starts in Chicago and then goes to really dominate other areas of the country, particularly Los Angeles. Uh, and you have a lot of ties, of course, to MCA, now Universal Studios, uh, people like Lou Wasserman and, uh, you know, affiliated with this particular super mob network. Um, and, and that's essentially uh, what the mega group ends up being. And again, that's that's Wexner and, and Charles Bronfman that create that. And Lester Crown is a is a founding member. And so you have, uh, you know, at that time, uh, the Crowns uh, and Wexner coming together uh, with the this merger I mentioned earlier in 1995, creating a new bank one. And it's these very entities that are responsible for selecting Jamie Dimon as CEO. So essentially, the very same network that's responsible uh, for the rise of Jeffrey Epstein is responsible for the rise of Jamie Dimon and, and putting him in this exact position he he is in today and making him one of the top bankers in the United States. And so it's important to remember that just like Jeffrey Epstein, uh, Jamie Dimon is a man who knows who put him uh, in a certain position of power and who he, he he's beholden to, essentially. Well, so it almost sounds, I mean, you've described Jeffrey Epstein as almost middle management, right? And so the tentacles, yeah. the tentacle spread and the roots go very, very deep. He, they're not the, he's not the one that was actually pulling the, the, the strings, so to speak. He was sort of in the middle and the, the, the power resides above mm -hmm. him uh, and, yeah. and names that people aren't familiar with that you've been pulling out in your book. So, um, I mean, my first question is just, are there certain qualities about Jamie or his background or, or why he would be the right choice where these people could essentially direct him in the way that they want? Or like, do you think that he's always, I mean, it sounds, this sounds like deep corruption, just corruption. I want power at the expense of yeah. anything else. So do you believe I think that Jamie Diamond's corrupt? Well, I think, you know, what you just mentioned is probably where the truth lies. So remember, you know, uh, basically Diamond got where he was with Citigroup, right? Um, because of, because he was basically the underling of Sandy Weil. And after a while, he was tired of being in Sandy Weil's shadow and it led to the spat. And then he gets, uh, you know, basically forced out or he resigns, it, depending on who you believe, from Citigroup. And after, you know, building up this uh, giant bank, uh, for for decades, you know, he's he's, you know, doesn't have anything. Right. And then, you know, people come along with an offer saying, we'll give you just as much, if not more power than your former mentor, Sandy Weil. Um, yeah, I think he was probably willing to play ball to be able to climb his way to the top. And now he's definitely outshone his mentor to a significant degree. Right. Um so, uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's hard. I mean, I don't know if anyone in the audience or you will relate, but it's like, I want to believe that people are good. I do. And that, you know, it, it, there's, there's something that happen happens in numbers and in groups where all of a sudden you have to defend, defend your power, your position, your, your community, your group. So maybe, maybe things start to go awry and then all of a sudden time goes by and it turns into just a, 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 a a spiral and and more more negative outcomes have happened when the intentions were good. I I just it's just hard to believe that people could be in these positions. They're elites. They don't have to worry about money. They wield all this power and influence, and they're okay with you know hurting people I, I, or being a part of a system at large. Maybe they're not directly hurting anybody, but the system that they're in hurts people. 
you know, hurts. Uh, them yeah, I don't off. think I don't think they care about that. I think these people live in their own little social bubble where they yeah. interact with people just like them. And then like, you know, they have servants who they don't really see on the same yeah. uh, <laughs> tier as them as being beneath them. And then they just, you know, do what they do because to a lot of these people, it's all a big game, you know. Wow. And they don't really uh, see their actions as having consequences. You know, a really good example of this is someone like Henry Kissinger, who makes all these insane foreign policy decisions when he's in power. And he's like, U.S. soldiers are pawns uh, for, you know, for people like me to essentially like move around the chessboard. And, you know, with with, you know, people like Jamie Dimon, I don't really see the mentality as being uh, that different. It's all about who's going to be top dog. I mean, he's probably still in his head competing with people uh, like Sandy Weil or other, you know, equivalents on on Wall Street and trying to be top dog. He's got something to prove. You know, he wants to be king of the castle, essentially. Uh, but he's not king of the castle. You know, he, he's he's king of the castle because p- certain people helped him get to that position. And it's, as I mentioned earlier, the same people that were responsible um, for Jeffrey Epstein. Epstein's activities. And this is why I think um, this JP Morgan uh, lawsuit about the Epstein ties is likely to be very revealing because you have the U.S. Virgin Islands uh, going after billionaires. You know, they're, they're subpoenaing people, people like Mort Zuckerman, Google co-founder Sergey Brin, who were definitely involved with a lot of these activities. Uh, but mainstream media has actually been unwilling to go after those people with the U.S. Virgin Islands is willing to uh, at least attempt to subpoena them and get to the bottom of things and willing to say that this went far beyond Jess Staley, who, by the way, J.P. Morgan case and this current lawsuit is trying to pin everything on him and say Jamie Dimon knew nothing Mm -hmm. Um, and the USVI is going very hard to say that Dimon definitely knew something and uh, given you know my research it's very hard uh, to believe that Dimon knew nothing at all when the same people responsible for him being in charge of JP Morgan Chase are the same people responsible uh, for Epstein and that you had people including at the time that Bear Stearns got absorbed into JP Morgan you know you have at that exact point uh, Epstein moving to JP Morgan from Bear Stearns after, as I mentioned earlier, Epstein seems to have been the person uh, that initiated the collapse of Bear Stearns personally, which is very insane in and of itself. Um, and then he becomes, you know, intimately involved uh, with that bank. And according to the USVI, there's internal reports where people, like top executives at J.P. Morgan, were joking about uh, Jeffrey Epstein's uh, pro- like interest in minors. Uh, you know, things like that. And in uh, uh, other internal reports they cited in this hearing, it was very clear that Jeffrey Epstein, even though he's nominally supposed to be running a financial advisory firm at this time, has no uh, financial activity consistent with any sort of client based business. So he's obviously involved in something else very bizarre. And he was also extending loans uh, to the company MC2, which was being run by Jean Luc Brunel, who was probably the top person along with Epstein that was part of this sexual trafficking operation. And of course, like Epstein, Brunel died under suspicious circumstances in a jail cell in Paris, not that long after Epstein died in 2019. Uh, So there's definitely something to hide. And if you're taking it, you know, to Jamie Dimon, who himself is a billionaire, you really are trying to, at least to some extent, uh, hold the powerful to account for this case, at least much more than anyone else with any sort of clout uh, has done since uh, the case really broke in earnest and became of major public interest in 2019. Yeah, well, the case is what I wanted to focus on next. And by the way, no relation to that Brunel, by the way, just in case anyone's wondering. Oh, yeah, it's spelled differently also. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Yeah. uh, But yeah, so so as you mentioned, people are getting subpoenaed. Um, you know, I, I, a lot of people who, when we've done our interviews before, they've asked, how come this black book is not out? How come the media is not focusing more on these connections, uh, that Epstein had to very, very powerful people that are still in office or still the head of corporations. Uh, but now in the mainstream, it is coming out that potentially Jamie Dimon knew that Epstein was a sex trafficker. What is the exact evidence that that reveals that 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 may be true and why is it the usvi that's going after it because you mentioned in your article i mean an an attorney got fired right after this case was filed i believe right yeah Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, Denise George was the attorney general of the USVI that filed this case, and she was uh, and she was fired just a few days later. So a lot of people, you know, connect uh, put two and two together, and uh, you know assume they're related, and they probably are. Um, and but they're still continuing to prosecute this case, um, and it's not exactly clear why them. I guess there's more uh, uh, interest there. Uh, and there were a lot of weird things that Epstein was doing in the U.S. Virgin Islands, uh, looking to recruit youths to work for him, for example, wanting to collect a bunch of DNA of uh, U.S. Virgin Islanders and turn it into what he referred to as a biomedical Google. So, you know, maybe there's different reasons we don't know about why they're very unhappy with Jeffrey Epstein's activities and their uh, his presence in, in their, you know, well, I would say country, but really the U.S. Virgin Islands is essentially a colony of the United States. Um, But uh, to be honest, a lot of the U.S. legal and justice system is not going to go after the people actually responsible for Jeffrey Epstein. So that's probably why it's coming from someplace like the USVI. It definitely would never come from a a place like the Southern District of New York um, or anything like that, because obviously, you know, in my opinion, the only reason they went after Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell was because of, um, you know, factional um, power plays between different powerful groups uh, among the U.S. elite. Uh, that wanted to use, uh, you know, take down Epstein for particular reasons. Um, And we can speculate why that might be later on. Um, But I think there's, um, you know, there definitely is a lot to prosecute here if people were actually interested. But again, it involves going after very powerful individuals um, in the United States and very powerful networks. So, you know, for example, this super mob network that I mentioned earlier that that goes back decades and decades, um, those these particular networks, for example, the Crowns in Chicago and another super mob family from Chicago, intimately related to them, the Ritzkers are essentially responsible for people like Barack Obama uh, and the Clinton family. Well, at least uh, some of the Clinton family, you know, obviously you have, you know, Arkansas with Jackson Stevens and and similar uh, organized crime linked intelligence linked uh, billionaires and and businessmen in their rise. But, you know, Hillary Clinton's unsuccessful presidential campaign, for example, had a lot of ties to the Pritzkers and uh, in the crowns. uh, And these guys have a lot of influence over the Democratic Party specifically, uh, actually currently a Pritzker is governor of the, of the state of Illinois. You know, these are very powerful people still today. And of course, Wexner is uh, the most powerful man in the state of Ohio. He has been for decades. Um, He uh, is widely believed to essentially control the most important political offices there. Um, And the uh, at least during his lifetime, the other richest man in Ohio that was a business partner of Wexner's, uh, Edward de Bartolo, was also a a well-known organized crime associate. Um, So, you know, if it's true for Ohio and it's true for Illinois, it's probably true for a lot of other states in the U.S., And these networks are very interconnected. They're very insidious. So you start pulling on the thread of one and exposing one, it's going to bring out a lot of stuff um, about how uh, the political system in the United States actually operates. And I think um, they don't want that to happen. (laughs) You know, I think that's pretty clear. Well, Mm -hmm. and the criminal justice system isn't going after these people. Media really isn't going after these people. Uh, people like uh, Elizabeth Warren are supposed to defend the public against the big bankers. And yet it seems like all of their policies only create a stronger and stronger uh, consolidation of these powerful people. And I'm sure that, you know, they, they, they have a lot of influence in Washington, DC, the, the people like Jamie Dimon. So um, do you think that this banking crisis, because a lot of people, I, I, they were freaking out about a month ago, right? Thinking that this is going to, be another 2008 moment and uh, and we're going to slowly start to unwind. The Fed will have to come in and pivot and all of a sudden we're going to be printing and mooning on, on all the speculative assets. But but in seriousness, I mean, they stepped in, they provided this, you know, loan facility so that the banking system doesn't go under, but things are not, we're not in the clear by any means. No. What do you think is going to play out? Because I know you mentioned earlier and you talked about it on one of my other shows, there might be some kind of coordinated attack at some point that ushers us all into a new system with these central bank digital currencies. But how is this yeah. going to play out? Like, What should people watch for over the coming months? 
Yeah. So I think essentially what's happening now is that we're seeing efforts to sort of kick the can down the road until the solution they want to offer people when this crisis really kicks off. Because as I'm sure your audience knows, a lot of, um, you know, what's coming is essentially inevitable just because of the nature of a debt-based monetary system and a lot of the insane monetary policy that followed the 2008 economic crisis. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that eventually, you know, and also, you know, the U.S. government debt. I mean, there's there's so many issues coming to a head um, for the U.S. economy right now. And then you have major challenges, for example, that are on uh, picking up with increasing speed uh, challenges to the petrodollar system or the, the right. status of the U.S. as a global reserve currency um, and, and things of that nature. So there's a lot of compounding problems. I would argue that there's going to be an effort to kick the can down the road until they can offer their quote unquote solution, which I think is pretty clear going to be some sort of precursor to the CBDC or the CBDC itself. Um, and I think they have uh, more infrastructure to put in place before they want that to happen. Um, so, you know, I think people should essentially consider, uh, you know, this crisis is very real. Now is the time to prepare because there is a lull, but it is a planned lull. And after the lull is going to come a planned controlled demolition. I was, I was just people, about to say those words. It sounds yeah. like controlled demolition. Well, and people yeah. don't realize too, central bank digital currencies are going to involve these big banks. It's not going Absolutely. to be, that you, it, it's going to be kind of tied in, entirely with them. So you'll have one account that's maybe a retail account, but another that's tied directly to the the government and it will be that yeah. infrastructure is going to be kind of tied together. Do you know exactly how that'll work where, because obviously a central bank digital currency, some might think, well, that would make the commercial banks obsolete. Why would you need a Chase yeah. Bank account if you have mm -hmm. a CBDC and an account with the Fed? But it's not like that. There's actually an incentive to have fewer banks because those banks will have that relationship with the central bank. We'll be allowed and, to have that relationship. And you'll only yeah. bank with them. How will that work? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so I guess the model people can look to for this has actually uh, already been implemented in Russia. So, of course, Russia's central bank is working on a CBDC. Uh, but there's also the Spur coin that was launched by Spur Bank, which I believe is Russia's biggest bank. Um, and uh, I think uh, the Russian government is the majority owner of Spur Bank. But the guy that runs Spur Bank, Herman Graf, is a devoted, uh, uh, you know, I, what would you call him? Uh, like a devoted follower of Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum. Uh, very much uh, pushing for, you know, the use of biometrics as payments and a lot of this other stuff that sort of gets referred to as, you know, a coming technocracy or uh, the rollout of the fourth industrial revolution. And so it's very likely that JP Morgan is positioning itself to sort of be that equivalent in the United States. For example, you've already had them in the past few weeks openly push for mass adoption of biometric payments. They're going to start making it available to their clients, paying with your face, paying with your palm. Of course, Amazon is rolling, uh, attempting to roll the, these types of payment methods um, out as well. And then more recently, you have Jamie Dimon in the past couple of days saying um, that, it, that private land, uh, private property should be seized by the government for the purpose of developing so-called yeah. clean energy uh, for climate change. So that yep. tells you, um, 15 uh, by the way, cities, 15 minute yeah, cities, people so, should really look into those too. Yeah. So Diamond is, uh, for people that don't know, openly affiliated with the World Economic Forum, and he supports a lot of these policies as well. Um, and JP Morgan, you know, after any big consolidation move is definitely one of the two big to fail banks that the federal government will move to uh, protect at all costs. And I think Diamond's very aware of that. And essentially what will happen, I, I think, is, you know, JP Morgan saying now, oh, well, now we're rolling out this feature where you can voluntarily pay with your face or your, your fingerprints or a palm scan. Uh, but what happens when JP Morgan says, well, actually, we've decided for a reason X, Y, and Z, uh, that this is the only way you'll be allowed to pay from now on uh it's it's you know you, you give a bank like jp morgan all that power it's not going to be hard for them uh to do yeah. and uh, unfortunately because of the silicon uh, valley bank crisis and the resulting aftermath i mean you had people in the days after that pretty much saying that one of the big winners was already at that point just days after the collapse jp morgan chase because so many people were opening and moving accounts yeah. there because the federal government was essentially signaling if you go to one of these two big to fail mega banks your money will be safe 
Yep. Um, so, I mean, it's hard not to see this as a concerted policy push to get people to feel like their money is only safe in one yep. of these giant mega banks that's on board for uh, these agendas, whether it's CBDCs or biometric payments, programmable money. Um and I think it's pretty clear that that Jamie Dimon is definitely going to be on board for all of that. So, you know, if you're going to put your money with J.P. Morgan Chase because you think it'll be safe, well, yeah, it might be safe in a sense, but at what cost ultimately to your economic freedom and your civil liberties? You know, I think these are the questions that people should be, uh, you know, asking themselves. All right, it's time for another short break to hear these messages from my sponsors. Next, I'd love to share Crowd Health, a Bitcoin alternative to health insurance. Health insurance costs can be sky high today, and you send your money every month to a massive corporation, the health insurance black hole, and if you don't need any health care, you never see the money again. But if you do need a doctor, you end up having to pay even more out of pocket, especially if you end up as one of the 20% of claims on average that aren't covered. With CrowdHealth, you pay a small monthly fee that goes into an account that you accrue over time and is yours to use or keep if you ever leave. You can even save that money in Bitcoin. Crowd Health is all about community and the community crowdfunds everyone's health care. So if something happens to you or you have a doctor visit, Crowd Health negotiates down the medical bill lower than what insurance would be, and then the community helps you cover it. And in turn, you can help others cover their needs. For more information, you can head to joincrowdhealth.com slash Natalie. And if you use promo code Natalie, you get six months for $99. Next up, I Trust Capital. I Trust Capital lets you invest in Bitcoin for your retirement with the tax benefits of an IRA. You can defer taxes on gains using a crypto IRA, or with a Roth IRA, you can withdraw tax-free at retirement. And here are some important things to know. I Trust does not lend against client assets. I Trust accounts are FDIC insured up to $250,000 US dollars, and customer assets are held between Coinbase Custody and a custody platform called Fireblocks. Fireblocks, by the way, underlies pretty much the entire industry. So if you're doing retirement planning and considering adding Bitcoin to your IRA portfolio, you can sign up for an account and get a $100 bonus at itrust.capital slash Natalie Brunel. Now back to the show. Exactly. And you've been doing some investigations on the WEF and cybercrime and sort of this, they're fusing the tech sector with intelligence and government more and more. Um, I know that one, one thing that's happening with this push against crypto, because, you know, crypto in large part, this is, this is why this technology was, um, why the cypherpunks were so passionate about separating money from the state so that the the power would return to the individual as opposed to these centralized entities. Yeah. And Jamie Dimon's come out there <laughs> saying he hates Bitcoin. You know, he was at Davos uh, on TV mentioning that. But they're going after the platforms, the on-ramps. Um, a lot of people were talking about Custodia. And the main headlines focused on the fact that the Fed denied Custodia's application to be a member of the Federal Reserve because it was going to be a, a, a one-to-one backed yeah, reserve bank, but, but actually they wanted to release a stable coin, a private stable coin, and they don't yeah. want they don't want private stable coins. They want to control the digital dollar, right? But you you know what's weird though? The Federal Reserve had no problems approving uh, Farmington State Bank, the weird bank that Alameda Research and FTX poured millions of dollars into. Uh, that was previously a bank with like um, in, an, an insanely low number of deposits in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it's like a one room bank in rural Washington uh, yeah. with with really no presence and then they're able to get um really rapid approval by the san francisco fed um to to become you know a member i mean it's just really crazy um so apparently you know if you're tied up with the right people in crypto um you know you can get approval from the fed but if you're not tied up with the right people then you're not well, it seems, I mean, they, they are, they're worried about these on-ramps because they don't want trillions of dollars in, in stable coins and Bitcoin that they can't control. It's out of their, it's out of their control. And I don't know if you well, saw Well, they're the- competitors right. to CBDC, right? Well, because uh, CBDCs are so fundamentally unattractive. Yeah to most yeah. Americans uh, for obvious reasons that the only re- a way they can have widespread adoption is to have no competitors. So 
Uh, Stable coins, an obvious competitor. Natalie Smolensky, who's in the Bitcoin space, she wrote a Forbes article that said Congress moves to broaden president's emergency powers, reintroduced Internet export controls, and that there's been, you know, they've introduced several pieces of legislation in the last couple of months, the Restrict Act, the Act, the Data Act, yeah. the Antisocial. All, a lot of this is under the guise of, oh, we're trying to protect you from TikTok, like the, you know, China yeah. is controlling you. But actually, they're controlling you. Can you can you speak to that? Because like I said, you talked about this in your investigations into uh, the the moves against, you know, supposedly cyber crime, but actually it's just taking your data and controlling it and removing privacy and introducing surveillance. Yeah. So about tech talk, right? Like I have, I, I'm very sure that the Chinese national security state utilizes that for that purposes, but it's very insane to think the U.S. government hasn't been doing that to an even greater extent uh, with their tentacles very well deep and it's documented into every other social media uh, platform, whether it's Instagram, Facebook, uh, Twitter, um, they have back doors into all of it. And actually, it was a very suspect company called Varent Inc. that made all of those uh, back doors uh, into these platforms for the NSA. Um, so, you know, we've been mass surveilled on by our own government for a very long time. And so I would argue that any efforts to sort of make TikTok the bad guys just because they don't like competition for surveilling on their own populace. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, the U.S. national security state are the good guys, I would argue. It's really um, quite the opposite. So as I mentioned earlier, there's this WEF partnership against cybercrime and the U S government is openly part of that. And a major driver of that, along with some of these big multinational banks. Um, and some of the policies of this partnership are completely insane. Um, one of the ones I write about in my two part series on them is how they're basically lobbying to merge law enforcement with Wall Street banks and then at the same time with banking regulators. So, and this is all allegedly under the guise of stopping potential financial cyber crime. That hasn't it, happened yet, but if it did happen, it would be so catastrophic. So to prevent it, we have to merge, again, law enforcement agencies with Wall Street and banking regulators. So first right. of all, merging Wall Street with their regulators is crazy talk. I mean, it's obviously I mean, it kind insane. of already happens. There's a revolving door. One person works for well, this. Well, of course, there's a revolving the door. sector, but public, yeah. Exactly. But imagine, so there, there's a, you know, essentially they have fused in a sense through that revolving door, but imagine if the fusion is overt, how much yeah. stuff would happen, well, right? You said it in so the, at least they have to keep a veneer of the, of the idea yeah. that they're separate and independent, right? Yeah. If they don't have to do that anymore, it's a very different game. And if you add law enforcement into this right. nexus, no, it, first of all, Wall Street banks will never be held accountable for anything ever. Um, and But also, you know, any sort of, financial activity you're not allowed to do uh, engage in right in this paradigm where your financial activity is surveilled and you can uh you know get in trouble for spending your money on the wrong thing or donating to the wrong person or who knows what you know law enforcement will know right away and this is already happening to an extent as well so like with january 6 for example there was bank of america colluding uh with u.s capitol police uh to help them identify uh, alleged rioters on january 6 and a lot of other stuff that, you know, essentially, you know, you had people like Tucker Carlson call out Bank of America yeah. for acting as an unofficial intelligence agency in that regard. So essentially what you're having is an effort to formalize all of that and make it its own system uh, under the guise of cybercrime. And again, the FBI, the Department of Justice and the U.S. Secret Service are part of the body developing this policy. So this is, you know, a policy that our federal government is trying to enact and it's complete right. madness. Um, and, you know, the whole idea, one of their whole justifications, right, is, you know, uh, among other things to stop money laundering. And this is something we hear from people like Elizabeth Warren too, yeah. about why crypto essentially has to be eliminated. Uh, but money laundering has been going on from the big banks, HSBC, JP Moore. I mean, all these guys are, are known money launderers, including in HSBC's case. I mean, they were openly outed for money laundering for some of the biggest drug cartels in the world. 
Okay, he's, so he's how is eliminating yeah. crypto going to stop that, Elizabeth Warren? I mean, it's complete yeah. hypocrisy, and it's not. It's about protecting the money launderers that they work for and eliminating financial anonymity for the rest of us. Well, a lot of these banks pay more in fines on a yearly basis than everything <laughs> yeah. that was lost in the, the supposed crypto bubble burst. Um, and you mentioned in your investigative work that this this isn't just about financial transactions, but they could also potentially arrest people for disinformation. And it makes me think about everything that happened, you know, with, with Snowden, just revealing that all of a sudden you can, you, once you have one person's name and connections, you can link that to a web of, of, of so many other people. Now you have all of their data and information and, uh, and, and that can ultimately be used against you. You could be put on a list where you've, you've said something that, that it's worse than that. Government. And, because and, this, this is all about predictive People think oh, that sorry. because that was exposed that it's over, but it's not. No, it's worse because now it's about pre predictive policing. It's about pre-crime. And this is a key part, too, of the Biden administration's war on domestic terror with dovetails a lot, uh, the policies of which dovetail a lot with what we're talking about right now. It's all about uh, using our artificial intelligence to analyze all your online and financial activity and predicting if you may engage in some sort of naughty or criminal activity in the future, it's not just about what you do. It's what about what you might do. So that adds a whole extra level of insanity to this because you don't necessarily have to be guilty of any crime to be punished. Right. Yeah. This is a whole pre-crime paradigm. And that's why companies like Palantir are so critical to all of what's going on right now, uh, because these companies are about data mining and then and then using. I mean, uh, Palantir has been piloting predictive policing in the United States since at least 2015. Uh, and and there, in my opinion, as, as you know, my work has uh, pointed out um, the direct and intentional successor to a DARPA program called Total Information Awareness that was exactly about creating this sort of pre-crime uh, type paradigm in the United States after 9-11. And it was totally uh, attacked by, by the media, the ACLU, all these other organizations, because it would completely eliminate um, American privacy. It just privacy as a concept would cease to exist. And that's why it was defunded by Congress. But then uh, Palantir is resurrected as a completely private entity as opposed to a public private entity like it would have been under DARPA. Um, and apparently, it's fine. And the people that created Palantir worked with the people that were running TIA, who were who's actually a major co-conspirator in Iran-Contra, John Poindexter. Uh, right. Peter Thiel and Alex Karp go to him. They're connected to him by uh, the neocon and architect of the Iraq war, uh, Richard Pearl. And uh, in doing so, they make plans to create Palantir, the intended client of which, according to Alex Karp, was always the CIA. The CIA was their first uh, client for the first three years of their existence as a company, uh, and the CIA helped them design their, their platform. And now they contract for all 18 U.S. intelligence agencies. And one of the things they do is they label people as subversives. And there's yeah. this policy since the 1980s, again, developed by this Iran-Contra nexus called Con the continuity of government protocol and there is a database that of americans millions of americans they deem subversive um that under the un if ever enacted and uh, in order to enact this protocol all you need is a vaguely defined national emergency wow. And then these Americans can just have their constitutional rights completely suspended. Uh, and that's what we're essentially sleepwalking into. And all you really need is the right domestic terror false flag or the right cybercrime false flag. And all this stuff has been being built for decades and waiting in the wings. And it's total insanity. And it's very interesting you have Peter Thiel uh, come up in that particular context because Peter Thiel, even though he describes himself occasionally as a Bitcoin maxi, uh, is the guy that said on stage next to CIA director Mike Pompeo that Bitcoin might be a Chinese financial weapon against the U.S. and all this other stuff. And of course, he himself played a very odd role in uh, the run on the Silicon Valley Bank not that long ago. So he's definitely someone to pay more attention to, I would say. And I certainly wouldn't trust what he says publicly, at least about claiming to be a Bitcoin maxi at face value. It's very interesting. I know he did. He did speak at the big Bitcoin conference last year. You know, all, all this sounds so dystopian. And like you said, we might be sleepwalking into it, but I do, I know that I do what I do and you do what you do because we want to make change for the better and have hope that it could get better. 
right? I mean, future generations yeah. should not enter a world like this. And so Bitcoin does provide that hope for a lot of people. So I'm just kind of curious in terms of your own journey studying Bitcoin. Do you think that Bitcoin um, has the potential to be something that saves us from this? Or do you think that the powers that be could squash it, especially because right now it still depends on so many fiat on ramps and it, it's not as big yeah. as you know we'd like it to be. What are your thoughts on that? So what concerns me is that you have, again, this WEF partnership against cybercrime. They link not just Bitcoin in terms of its existence as a driver of cybercrime, but any sort of value, Bitcoin having any sort of value of significance. Right. So essentially what they say there is that in order to stop cybercrime, uh, you should not just stop people from being able to use Bitcoin as a currency. You should essentially uh, target Bitcoin and drive its value down to zero, because as long as it has value, it's still a driver of cybercrime. So that's pretty crazy. And if you consider, you know, the insane efforts that are technically really illegal of the U.S. government right now to stop, for example, uh, banks from from, uh, um, from engaging in crypto business like you had with um, Signature Bank, for example. I mean, that's totally insane what happened there um, and, and really egregious. Um, you know, if, if this type of activity continues, which is likely um, it, what we could see could be truly unprecedented stuff like efforts to completely illegalize the use of Bitcoin as a currency. Now, what, would that actually be able to work? Um, would people still be able to get around that? It depends on how they do it. And it depends on um, how successful this dragnet of surveillance and this effort to completely upend privacy, you know, how it actually goes. Um, Unfortunately for me, you know, I I do hold some Bitcoin, um, but at the end of the day, when you're facing, you know, you know, when it seems like a major economic crisis is waiting in the wings, Bitcoin, just like gold, you can't eat it, right? So there, there's certain things that I think people should do to prepare that involve, you know, uh, taking care of your more immediate needs, maybe having a food store, or having plans like that about securing, you know, your basic needs for you and your and your family in some type of of crisis. But at the same time, too, with Bitcoin, I think it's important to keep in mind, you know, there are there is a lot of technology that certain people use to to try and keep um, their Bitcoin or, or their cryptocurrency transactions in general for being surveilled. But me personally, uh, knowing what I know about the national security state, I don't really have any illusions of privacy in that regard. Um, so, you know, I think people need to keep this stuff in mind and be uh, realistic. But ultimately, you know, I do really like the ethos of a lot of Bitcoiners um, because they really are to, at the frontier of fighting a lot of these encroachments on basically uh, what is the end of privacy uh, for Americans. Um, but I think there's a lot of other ways that this needs to be tackled as well. Um, and one of it, um, you know, I, I, there was a really good article uh, that I read the other day written in Off Guardian, uh, which is a UK outlet. And uh, it was essentially arguing that, you know, our uh, slavery to convenience in the form of the smartphone is essentially what's being used to push us into this paradigm. And I was interested, uh, listening to this interesting interview the other day by a guy, um, uh, named E.B. Tucker, and he was sort of talking about this uh, cyber attack paradigm uh, that is talked about a lot in these in these WEF policy papers, and how um, you know what they uh, his theory about what they could do is you know oh there's this uh, cyber crime the cyber attack your phone starts working and the federal government tells everyone oh your money's not safe so we're so for your security we're transferring your holdings and this or that regardless of what it's in, yeah. into CBDC tokens or something right. like that, or some other sort of paradigm like that. I think people need to be really aware of that and have some sort of, you know, cold storage option yeah. for Bitcoin um, or something like that, where if that is uh, the way they try and get people onboarded to CBDC, whether they like right. it or not, which is, you know, more likely than not, to be honest, right. uh, you know, people need to be prepared for that in the Bitcoin community and have, you know, a really, uh, spend some serious time thinking about if this stuff does come to pass, what are you going to do? And if you uh, want to continue using Bitcoin, how are you going to, you know, ensure that you will be able to use it, even if the regulatory and, you know, law enforcement, you know, gets involved trying to go after Bitcoiners uh, in a very yeah. uh, aggressive way. You know, I think uh, we don't want to sleepwalk into any of these sorts of situations. So, you know, even though it sounds kind of dire, uh, you know, it's just important for people to be aware of what the state 
stakes are and what these people are planning. Uh, otherwise, you might be caught unprepared, right? I'm really glad you mentioned cold storage because you're right. If it's on any of these platforms, just because you have Bitcoin, if it's not your keys, not your coins, they could potentially cut off, you know, any of these arteries and, and, and they have these choke points. And it is important to recognize that that's, you know, Bitcoiners are really trying to fight against this. They, the cypherpunks in the nineties are the reason that the Biden and other bureaucrats didn't succeed in, in their um, crackdown on encryption and, and online privacy and so we really, um, I think, you know, more information needs to get out because like you've mentioned before, the power is with us. And uh, so I guess my mm -hmm. last question where I want to wrap it up is, do you think that, you know, going back to that idea of controlled demolition, are we just in this holding period before it all culminates in some massive collapse, systemic crack, unwinding, another crisis to usher us onto this, this scary spaceship. Um, and why, why do you have hope or, you know, do you still have hope that we will have these parallel systems in place like Bitcoin and enough people know about them to empower them? Cause we got to give them the, you know, power and strength so that we get off that ship. Yeah, so I do think the controlled demolition thing is essentially inevitable because if if they know the system's going to collapse and you know we know it's going to collapse at some point, um, you know, and I I'm not you think part it's gonna be like a guys. moment, like a moment, like a like a well, not necessarily one moment, but I think you'll have one event and then a chain of events after it. Well, you have to keep in mind too the 2008 financial crisis that took several months to play out, right? So if you see Silicon Valley Bank and its collapse as the beginning of this financial crisis, even you know it, this could be playing out over the next few months or the next couple years. You know, it really depends on how they try and drag it out and for um, what purpose. And you know, ultimately. Um, you know, a lot of it might come down to things as simple as Federal Reserve policy, whether they continue to, um, you know, uh, fight inflation, quote unquote, raising interest rates, even though there's a bunch of uh, banks on the brink and all of this stuff. After Silicon Valley Bank, people thought they weren't going to hike and then they did hike. Um, and you have to keep in mind, too, that there's, um, you know, Catherine Austin Fitz and, and some other people have pointed out that BlackRock has had a lot of um, undue influence over what the Fed does, whether that's uh, the, the going direct research re, uh, reset plan they made with the fed in jackson hole in late 2019 about what their covid19 monetary policy would be before covid19 happened um or their prediction after Silicon Valley Bank that they would hike rates when everyone else said they wouldn't. And then BlackRock turns out to be, I mean, they have a lot of influence there. And you have, you know, these big guys, whether it's Jamie Dimon or people like Larry Fink pushing to totally reimagine, they say, major global financial institutions like the World Bank and the IMF and all this other stuff going on. There's a lot of madness uh, going on here, but they're obviously making plans, right? And so... I would argue that, um, again, it, it's probably going to be um, a controlled demolition in the sense that they know it has to collapse at some point and they want to be able to control that collapse for their explicit benefit um, and for the implementation of the policy agendas uh, that they want implemented, um, you know, for again, for their benefit, not for our benefit, right? So that's what we have to look out for. And whether uh, or not people are successful in avoiding all of this ultimately depends on what people do right now. So again, um, and I've said in a lot of past interviews, what it comes down to is how uh, enslaved we are to our own convenience and the system as it is right now. Sometimes it's very hard to change your habits, but now is the time to do that. Uh, and it can be, you can start off with things as simple as divesting from big tech you know, uh, get for example, if you don't want to stop having a smartphone, you can at least invest in uh, a de-googled phone or one that doesn't use an operating system from a big tech overlord. Because you know, for example, if Google, you have an Android phone and Google shuts down your Google account, you can't really use your Android phone anymore unless it's a de-googled Android. It's very easy for them to take that away from you. And what would you do if you didn't have your smartphone? Some people in the United States and elsewhere would you know go totally insane uh, and wouldn't know what to do with them themselves, right? So, you know, people need to be thinking about this stuff and it's not necessarily that hard. And I think another thing people need to divest from as well is legacy social media, um, because to be honest, those platforms are totally controlled and it's like a psyop fest 24 seven on places like Facebook and Twitter. You don't know what's a real account and what's not, if the person you're talking to is real or what's not, um, why things are allowed to go viral. I mean, there's the U.S. military specifically has been pouring millions of dollars in how to manipulate people using 
and social media since at least 2011. Uh, and one of their programs was to try and use social media to control uh, people like they control drones, like basically turn people uh, and direct them like they were robots by using social media and creating fake influencers whose message they then manipulate. It's, it's a completely manipulated environment, information environment. The alternative to that is to start using RSS feeds again and get an RSS reader app or something like that. You go to the websites you like and you essentially create your own news feed and take out the middleman social media completely so you don't have a manipulated information algorithm anymore. There's a lot of ways uh, of, of these different challenges that people can address right now. And of course, you know, ultimately, at the end of the day, people need to think about um, how you're going to keep you and your family uh, fed, sheltered, safe during, uh, you know, a time when there's a complete economic collapse. Uh, so the U.S., you know, 2008 uh, was an economic crisis, but it wasn't exactly a complete economic collapse. So I live in South America. I know a lot of people from Argentina. They experienced a complete economic collapse in 2001 that was really really crazy and essentially what i've heard from people over there is that the best way uh to handle that is to be mentally prepared for things getting insane because if you're not you're going to make impulsive very bad decisions most likely based out of fear the more prepared you are whether it's mentally or you know physically or whatever you know the better off you will be because that is really the paradigm we are facing and i definitely think they want to make it um extreme enough where people will willingly take the CBDC option or be scared enough right. uh, to give away more of their freedoms for a feeling of greater security. And this is, you know, the paradigm that's been used time and time again uh, to take away our freedoms. And we have very few freedoms left to take, right? Yeah. And uh, to paraphrase the Benjamin Franklin quote, you know, those who give up their uh, freedom for security will have or deserve neither, right? And that's essentially what will happen. Uh, this is a pre-planned crisis. Uh, the way it's going to play out has been planned. And their main tool is fear. So the more you give into that fear and follow where that fear leads you, uh, the more you'll be, you know, the deeper you'll yeah. be led into the system that they're creating, right? Yeah. So these are things to think about when thinking about, you know, what to do. Uh, to prepare yourself. But ultimately, I have hope that enough people will do it, but I don't think everyone will do it. And it might be something like COVID-19 again, where you have a rift among people, um, you know, people going one way and people going the other way. But unfortunately, you know, you have to decide if how much your sovereignty matters to you and if you're willing to make tough decisions to keep it, because we're really at a point where if you don't take the time to think about that stuff or make those decisions, you will lose it. They yeah. will take it from you. I'm going to move on your island, Whitney. We're going to have our own freedom, freedom <laughs> land. I mean, it, but it's true though. Freedom is not a given. It is very fragile and we have to fight to defend it. We have to strengthen yeah. it. Otherwise it's going to erode very quickly. It's interesting that you brought up RSS feed because the other day I read the background of this guy, Aaron Swartz, who helped invent it. And he was fighting yeah. for a lot of this and um, tr tragic death. But, you know, this idea that we really do have to take control and the, the internet should be open and our privacy and our data should be protected, but we're moving in the opposite direction. And things like Bitcoin do do give me hope. Um, the idea that through cryptography and and Bitcoin, we could digitally sign to verify things in a world of AI and psyops and all of that. I mean, I really hope we go in the right direction because otherwise I'm I'm scared of the future and I refuse to accept that reality right now. So, so thank you so much, Whitney. I don't know if you have any final thoughts, but uh, everyone check out her article, Rise of Jamie Dimon. You have more articles about the Crown family and just going even deeper coming out. The book, One Nation Under Blackmail, amazing. Whitney, I'll give you the, the floor. Yeah, well, the only thing I'd add to that is uh, in May, I will probably, if all goes well, be speaking at the Bitcoin Magazine Conference. So... <laughs> Uh, maybe see you there. <laughs> well, I'm very, very excited about this. Awesome. Awesome. Everyone go to the, you, you can get, uh, tickets b.tc slash conference code hodl for 10% off and go see Whitney. Any, anything else, Whitney? I, I just love <laughs> no, you. I'm that's such it. a fan. Uh, uh, you can find my work at unlimitedhangout.com. We have a newsletter that you can sign up to. If you don't want to do the RSS feed stuff, you can get all my, my content straight to your inbox and not really have to worry about, uh, crazy social media antics because it's it's only going to get crazier. We need more journalists like you. You are so brave. Uh, just thank you so much for for all you do. And I'll talk to you soon, Whitney. Okay. Thanks so much.
so much. Thank you so much for checking out this episode of Coin Stories. Again, hit like on the video and make sure that you have those notifications on so you don't miss out on any new episodes. And I would love to hear from you. If you have suggestions, feedback, guest requests, please email me at natalie at talkingbitcoin.com. Thanks so much.